Thank Good you. Night. <laughs>
with the health sphere or the mental health sphere at all. Um, what changed things was that a friend of ours was sectioned under the Mental Health Act after a suicide attempt. Um, and when we visited her, we actually were quite shocked by the kinds of environments that she was receiving care in. Um, obviously a distressing moment for anybody, but I think it, we were particularly um, struck by that hope that she would want to kind of start to feel better and recover. And we didn't think that the space she was in was ideal for kind of pushing her on that journey. Um, so we kind of had an idea. Um, we wanted to have a look more broadly, whether this was just a personal experience and a one off or whether it was a wider issue. And we found that the CQC had called environments inadequate. We had seen that the NHS five year forward view said they weren't conducive to recovery. Um, and we saw a lot of press articles and things around the same thing. We also went out and we spoke to people um, and we found a lot of difficult words and phrases being associated with these spaces. Um, so we really, really wanted to do something about it. And we knew we had the community of artists that we have worked with over a number of years prior to that. And we also had the kind of technical skills and the understanding of materials to be able to meet the various clinical requirements of each space. Um, so we wanted to ask whether there could be an alternative. Um, this is a case in point. It's one of our very early projects took place here. It's a recovery college in um, Tooting. It's a pioneering service, first of its kind in the UK, obviously has the peer tutor model, um, and offers invaluable support to people who um, who need it. And we kind of thought, well, you know, walking up to this building maybe for the first time, you don't necessarily think I'm about to receive award-winning care and I'm a valued member of society. But you know, what if we could convey something of that in the visuals? You know, what if a de-escalation room in a PQ could have that sense of calm and tranquility? Um, hallways and passageways, could they have points of interest or could they provide me with something to talk about? Or could we bring the outside into forensic medium secure services? And that's really what we've been doing in hospital rooms is commissioning really fantastic professional artists to work in collaboration with patients and with staff to rethink how inpatient mental health units can look and how they can feel. Um, we also really try and shout about our projects. So we recognise that a lot of the time um, inpatient mental health services can be very unseen um, and lots of people don't know what they are or that they really exist. And so we want people to know about these projects beyond the walls of the mental health institution. Part of that is creating books like these for every single project that we do that includes professional <laughs> images of all the artworks that have been created, as well as uh, testimonials from patients that we've worked with and um, texts from the artists about how they came about their idea and, and implemented their work. Um, we also have exhibitions in public institutions to share what has happened within these within these hospitals. This example is in Southampton City Art Gallery, um, where our artists recreated some of the pieces that have been made in a young person's forensic unit in Blue Red House. And we also hold other public events, exhibitions and fundraisers to tell people more broadly that this is a need um, and that we need support and that um, the work is important. And finally, we, we look to get a lot of press. So we really use the artists that we work with. Um, we push them to create artwork that could rival anything that they would do for a cultural institution. Um, we ask them to support us in um, sharing the work as widely as possible through 
online media, print, social media. And we also work closely with clinical teams to try and give some gravitas to the impact that we have and to publish the findings of our evaluations around our work. Um, so yeah, we've run into a few challenges in light of the recent pandemic. Um, what is absolutely central and at the heart of our work is people. Um, and in a way that that's kind of called co-production, but it sounds a little bit um, more sterile. Actually, what we do is we bring people together, whether that's the arts community, whether it's service users, staff, and we work in really close proximity where people can learn a creative skill. They can get a sense of how an artist work or how they're, what techniques they use, even installing works inside the unit sometimes and so that proximity is something that has been totally taken away at the moment we can't enter units at all and this puts the charity into a fairly precarious situation because obviously a lot of our funding is tied to delivering those projects but as always we are trying to be innovative and we are trying to always reach the people that we want to work with and we have found a number of different and innovative ways to do that um, and Tim's going to tell you a little bit more about that. So the first thing that we did when the lockdown started was we thought how can we how can we initially still connect with patients within the units if we're not able there if we're not there doing workshops and at first it was just going to be for um, units that we were working with at the moment so we've got six six projects lined up we were meant to be starting three or four of them uh, a couple of weeks ago so we thought let's put together some arts activities pdfs that could just be shared and they could be really simple activities that are easy to lead uh, in pqs and other units and we chose about was it 11 or 12 workshops that have been led by artists and we consulted with them and then we kind of distilled down the idea so we could make them in three four five six seven steps uh, with with information about what materials you need and often it's, it's as simple as pens and paper like this exquisite birds workshop and we and we sent them out to the units we were working with but then we put it out on twitter if you work in an inpatient mental health unit get in touch and we'll send you these pdfs and um, so far there's been more than 100 units have been in touch and and have um have got these pdfs and i think that they've been shared more widely as well um, and this is a cyanotype workshop so it's it's a simple way of making a print using the sun on blue paper uh, that was led by steve mcleod it's something that was um it, it was one of the most popular workshops we had. Every patient and every staff member took part when they saw how simple it was and the results you could get from a perfect one for the summer. Um, and we have collage workshops, painting workshops, um, all different kinds of things, how to make a camera obscura with a cereal box, things like that. Um, we've got um, we've got these activities. I'll show you the link in a minute, but they're they're mainly they are made so that they could be done safely in inpatient units but some of them do have optional scissors things like that so you just need to risk assess obviously for your own uh, specific um, service users we've also started doing some videos this is the first one which is a trainer painting workshop so it's also available on, on our activities page it links through to youtube um, it's basically they're, they're 10 minute videos where you could you could follow them and you know this one is how to make your trainers into a wearable piece of art and it's been amazing to see images sent to us of staff leading sessions in the units and some of the artworks made have been fantastic so if you go to our website uh, hospitalrooms.com uh, activities they're all there to either see online or you could download the pdfs for yourself you're very welcome to email us if it's easier for us just to email you the whole set uh, and we're happy to do that we can send them just as pdfs that you could print off so there's a few other people and places where you can find inspiration for arts activities if you want to 
If you're on Instagram, there's the Isolation Art School that was started up at the end of March, and that was started by um, Keith Tyson, who's a Turner Prize winning artist. And he's got lots of artists to do little talks or views around their studio or art workshops or little tips and techniques. And that's quite a good one to follow. Artist Viral Network is very new. It's it's not so much activities based, but some people might find it interesting because it's artists talking about books they're reading at the moment and it kind of gives a bit of insight into the way artists work. Oxfordshire Kindness Wave, if you look on their website, I think it's about the second page in, they've got they've started doing videos um, and step-by-step -step guides of how to do quite fun art workshops where you don't necessarily need paint or much in the way of materials. It's things like how you make a Mona Lisa out of your, your clothes. Um, and then there's some other ideas, getcreative.com uh, and Grayson's Art Club, which you may have seen, which is on Channel 4 tonight at 8 p.m. He's, that, that's quite a nice, fun way of getting some different ideas and, and inspiration. If you Google Arts Council England Creative Lockdown, is it low down in lockdown? That's it. Um, there's, some, there's some other great links there too. So one thing that we've been told is that art materials are quite hard to buy and some trusts um, want to buy them in bulk and it's very difficult to get a hold of these materials. But I thought it might be useful to let you know of some of the websites that are actually delivering art, work, uh, art materials at the moment. So just before lockdown, the last thing we did the day before um, uh, everything, our offices were closed down. We scrambled together all the good quality art materials we had and we made several packs like this one and we sent them out to units we're going to be working with so that they can get on with um, some of the workshops and, and do some arts activities in the meantime. Um, we've, we've, sort of, we've installed the materials we've got now. I've, I've, I've just been looking at some of the stockists that we use. Um, we get some of the Free, uh, from different suppliers um, who support us as a charity, but these websites are the ones we always top up with. It's because the, qual the quality is pretty good uh, and they're also, they almost always have deals on. So Great Art, um, it, you'll probably have to wait, wait about a week with Great Art and jacksonsart.com. Great Art, it often comes from Germany, so it takes a little while. It doesn't cost any more for the postage and packaging, but um, just to bear in mind, some of these will take a bit longer than others. Cass Art and Cowling and Wilcox seem to be delivering quite quickly. I've had things um, come within, you know, three days. And Art Supplies and Art Discount are also very good for getting um, good quality art materials at a good price. Um, when we do the workshops, we try and make it like a bit of a special event. It's something we hope that patients and staff will look forward to. Um, often, it, often it happens on a, a certain day of the week. And usually it's with each artist that we work with on a project we will lead at least one workshop, which is a way of having a conversation that's not as direct as saying, what do you like for the space? Sometimes those direct questions of talking about the environment can lead to the same answers. And understandably, people, you know, when, when you say, what would you like? People often say a sky or a peaceful scene or a tree, but We've got six artists, so we don't need everyone doing the same thing. So the workshops are a really good way of having a more complex, interesting conversation without having to ask these direct questions. You know, you're keeping your hands busy, you're making, and you get to have these 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 really interesting um, dialogues about space and about the environments we're in. But when we set up the, the workshop room, we try and make it quite a special special place. So it feels a bit like an art studio. I just wanted to use this. Um, video of one of our workshops recently at a women's mental health unit in Plymouth and it was it's not something you could do in every unit but we're able to bring in a live owl for a live owl life drawing class. When we set up the room for that the first thing we do is we cover the tables and if it's going to be quite a messy workshop we cover the floor as well. Because it, they usually happen in activities rooms, we even in Peaky's uh, medium secure settings, we were able to get away with having plastic on the tables and generally the staff are more um, happy that we don't destroy anything uh, with paint than, uh, than bring the plastic in. So we take that under the tables. We try and make it feel a bit like a studio. So we have 
images out that might give a bit of inspiration. Often artists or anyone engaging in a creative activity have that daunting first moment of looking at a blank canvas or a blank piece of paper. And it really helps having visual stimulation around. So we often print lots of ideas off. Um, sometimes we, we fill the walls with images of artworks or, or just visual clues, things that might trigger a bit of inspiration um, that are relevant to the workshop that we're leading. And, and it, this, this is a PQ in Exeter and it kind of at least made this quite white space into something more akin to a studio. And we try and bring as many nice materials as we can, which is easy for us as we're an arts charity and we've built up lots of good materials and it's a bit more difficult, obviously, if, if you've got quite a limited budget. But we try and lay it out in a way that it feels like there's there's some real care there. And we, we try and sort of have a bit of a structure to the workshop. If we're in a rehab, a long stay rehab unit, often, you know, the workshops can go on for two hours and you'll get most people stay for that whole amount of time. But obviously in a PQ, if you get two people who stay for an hour, that's fantastic. But often it's a five minute or a 10 minute um, dip in and out and, and maybe make a mark. And, and that's fantastic too. So we try and set it up in a way that it feels very welcoming and open and that you, you feel free to come in and make a mark if you want to and you don't, um, there's no pressure to, um, to continue making. The other thing that we always do at the end is we try and think of a way we could present the artworks nicely so it doesn't just feel like it's something's made and you leave it or it goes in the bin or it goes in the shelf. At art school you, you always have, every term you have an art crit um, so you critique each other's artwork. Um, we try not to criticise each other's artwork, but we, we try and say nice things about what everyone else has been making. So one way of doing it is just to lay everything out. So with that owl workshop, um, strangely enough, there seems to be more staff on the unit than we'd ever seen before on that day. And I think uh, Mozart had something to do with that, but it was it meant we got a lot of artwork and actually there's, there's a lot of really good um, uh, mark makers and painters um, at the unit. So we laid everything out and it's a way of just looking at everyone's work and kind of saying what you like about it and just sort of talking about that workshop. Other things that we've done that are a bit more um, time consuming is we've made spaces into, and this is at Recovery College, but we've made spaces almost into places where you display patient artwork. So it means you could do a salon hang, almost like a museum where you piece as put as many pieces on the wall as you can. Obviously, this is easier in a recovery college than it is in, a, in an inpatient unit. But we have done it in inpatient units where we found higher up areas where we could start to install artworks made during workshops that could be added to and taken away. And they're fixed, um, but they're fixed in a way that they could potentially be removed by states if someone left and wanted to keep them. But actually, this, this unit's now got, you know, I don't know, 100 artworks in it in that room by patients. So we, we're at a point where we've, we've had to pause our projects. We're keeping in contact with the, the PQs and the medium secure unit and the MBU that we're, we're meant to be working in um, imminently. Um, but one of the things we've been talking about before uh, the lockdown was something called the Hellingly Art School. So the Hellingly Centre is a medium secure unit in Sussex, uh, part of Su Sussex Partnership Trust. And we had the most amazing project there. And part of the reason um, was because we got to know everyone so well. Um, it, obviously, people are there for several years on average. So when we first met people, when we first even started talking about the project through the workshops, um, through artist visits, gatherings and the artwork going up and the exhibition, public exhibition we had afterwards, it was mainly the same group of people. So we got to know them really well and we, we made the decision with um, with a nurse and an art therapist there, but it'd be an amazing idea if we can continue this project in some way. So together we came up with this idea for the Helling My Art School where um, we bring in a lot of artists we work with and, um, and also other creatives and have a kind of um, program, year long program that could be ongoing that basically made that unit into a creative hub of that hospital. It was like an art school and the idea is that the visiting lecturers and the workshops and the program we had would rival any art school in the country, but it would be for this very small group of people. 
that includes bringing in Turner Prize winners, um, you know, famous fashion designers, um, arts journalists, all these kind of people to lead workshops, um, do lectures, do one-on-one -on -one tutorials, treat it just, just like a university. And also have three semesters where we'd have three different artists and residents who'd work with patients to create an artwork for the unit and we'd get the whole thing funded. This would finish with a final show festival, which might uh, involve making a space that was um, within the grounds, but was also accessible by the, the public, um, make that into a bit of a mini museum where we it would have artworks by patients, it could be curated by patients, but we'd also collaborate with a well-known public collection um, so that it could have sort of works by well-known artists alongside the, alongside the patients. And this would be a really good draw for the public. And we did, it, it, part of that came about from the fact that we did have taxi drivers who drop us off at Hemingway Centre, you know, saying they were scared of the place. And we thought it might, you know, we were sort of saying this could be a really good way of bringing the general public in the community um, and, and patients together. Um, but this has obviously been put on hold. So we've, we've come up with an idea for a more digital version of this. Um, and we've, we're going to be um, getting a lot of artists we've worked with to lead sessions, workshop sessions, live digital sessions that units can tune into. Um, you know, obviously you don't have to have the video on, but if you've got internet, you'll be able to interact with the artist by asking questions a bit like we will do in a minute. So there's, you know, there is still a sort of conversation happening here. The whole thing would be recorded for, for units that wouldn't be able to, to do that. Um, and those units could ask questions in advance and we could still have that as part of the live Q&A part of the workshop. Um, and then these could be watched by units as well. So one of the things we we're going to be asking is is if there's any um any units who might be interested in taking part in these digital workshops um we're going to be working with professional artists so they're going to be amazing artists um we've already spoken to them they're really looking forward to doing this so if there's anyone who wants to get in touch you could um send us an email on info at hospital-rooms.com and we can carry on that conversation over the next few weeks as we're setting this up um, I think that's um, that's it. We've, we've got a website here. You're welcome to keep up to date with what we're doing. We have a newsletter. We have lots of exhibitions um, at the end of our projects. You're always welcome to come to those as well. And please follow us on the social media um, to, to see what we're doing. Um, I think we we can answer questions questions now. Unless Neve, there's anything else you wanted to say before that? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm going to leave. Um, Kate, is that right? Should I unscreen share? Yeah, if you can, that would be great. So we've had a few questions come through. Um, so first of all, how do we access the PDF arts and craft and crafts instructions? So it's really easy. You just go onto our website, which is hospital-rooms.com, and then across the top um, navigation, there is a tab that says activities. And the full list of them are all there. So you can have a look through the different individual activities. You click in through to them and the instructions are there. Or you can download a PDF A4 page that you can print off and take onto the units with you. So all of that is freely accessible on our website. And you're, you. you're also welcome if you wanted just to email us at info at hospital .com and ask us for the full set we can quite easily just send you all. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question comes from Diane. So she says, hi, Tim and Neve, lovely to see you both. As an art psychotherapist, artist and key in a supporter of hospital rooms, what might the art supporters within mental health services be able to do to support the work of hospital rooms whilst you are not able to work on site? It's great staff are running sessions and asking for online activities, but I know funding is key for hospital, for hospital rooms continuing into the future. That's incredibly generous. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think actually at this moment, any interest in our digi new digital program would be amazing because we do understand that within a PQ setting, bringing in a video link, bringing in internet access, really accessing 
you know, devices like phones or laptops or iPads is a relatively new thing because of the pandemic, you know, um, and enabling visitors and everything else. We think that, you know, if we're using that technology for therapies and for visits, we can also use them to address people's intellectual and creative needs. And although it will be a little bit of an experiment and a new thing to try, if any units are kind of um, interested enough and have a moment to work with us on how to actually deliver that and get it to patients, you know, we'd be so interested to hear from you. We do have interest already, so there's a few different units who we had already been working with or um, have worked with in the past. But what we'd love to do is, you know, to reach as many people as possible with these sessions. So please do get in touch if that sounds like something of interest, if you'd like to provide video links with professional artists to do those sessions with your patients. Um, we'd love to collaborate with anyone on those. Um, as well as that, we are um, we do have a fundraising campaign going. We do have little um, flash sales of artworks and things like that that are just kind of keeping the charity sitting over while we can't get into units and, and while we're kind of grappling with that situation. And all of that information is on our website as well. Um, but yes being in touch, social media, email, and participating in our digital art school would be um, the key ways, I think. Thank you. Yeah, great. So someone else has asked, I'm guessing this is for when um, you're able to get back on site to services, but do you have a criteria for which units, uh, for the units that you work with and how, how do people apply to work with you? So usually people get in touch via email and we do have an application system. So when we first started, it took us about eight months to convince any unit to want to work with us, which is completely understandable because, um, you know, we didn't know if we could do a good job um, and do it safely. But si since then, we get a lot of people get in touch, um, but we, we have an application form that you can you can fill out and we're happy to talk through um, talk through all of that with you. Um, we we always work with six artists, so we don't we don't just do single artworks. We do get a lot lot of um, units getting in touch saying that they have one room that they'd like um, one artwork for. But we've kind of found that we we like making the unit into a kind of special creative hub where we spend months and months and months um, on site doing workshops with artists. There we find it's kind of this inch wide, mile deep effect is much more meaningful. Um, it does mean that we could only do about six projects a year because they're so intense. But the things, the things uh, that are most important is that there's a team and there's a community on the unit that actually really want it to happen. Um, because this, you know, if there's there's real enthusiasm for it. It works so well, and the projects we've been doing have been amazing because there's there's a whole team there who mm -hmm. you see the value of a project like ours. Um, we ask for a contribution towards the project. So the project costs costs between about 40 and 50,000 pounds to do all in. And we ask for about 15%, which is about seven and a half thousand pounds from the trust towards the project. Then we fundraise for the rest. We get a lot of money from Arts Council from different trusts and foundations and we do fundraisers and we raise all that money because we pay all the artists we get professional artists that's a lot less than what they'd normally get paid but but we pay for all their materials they're you know a small fee for them um and and everything else and we you know post the exhibition and everything like that too and the other thing is we all the work we've done so far has been in the south of england um we've done lots of work in the southwest and the south and in kent and you know suffolk and norfolk and, and a lot in london so for the next sort of couple of years, we might prioritise um, project, uh, projects in units that are a little further north, which isn't to say that we won't continue doing projects in London and the south as well. But, um, you know, we're, we're definitely looking to do projects further north just because we haven't done that yet. Um, but, but really, the answer is we, 
we're really welcome to speaking to anyone about doing a project with you. It takes a bit of conversation and we also take it to our trustees who um, help make, it, make the decision too. But you can just email us and we're very happy to, to talk about it. Thanks. And um, we've got another question from Wendy who, who asks, the activities shown so far require ability that many patients in the PQ do not have whilst being acutely and thoroughly unwell, ill. Um, so an activity is not doable by all patients as they vary in both motivation and functional ability. So how do you advise nurses about this? So there's probably about half, half the workshops are ones that we've led in PQs and some of them are definitely more compl complicated than others. Some of them require a bit more effort, um, you know, time from the staff to set up. Um, but there's ones like Harold Offay's wax rubbings workshop um, that we led at Croydon PQ that worked really well. It's very it's very simple because it's it's kind of picking up patterns from surfaces. Um, cyanotype workshops work very well. It takes a bit of preparation because you need a kind of a water bucket and you need to buy the paper. Um, but it's simple enough that you need to you just need to put the paper out and you could put an object on it or put your hand on it in the sun for 15 seconds and then it's about running it through a water bath. Um, so I think there's there's definitely a few um, there's a few workshops that are that, that are much more challenging for people in pickies, but um, but we hope there's a few that, that should be able to be led. And we've led we've probably led half of those in in pickies. Mm -hmm. If if Wendy wanted to get in touch, we'd be happy to say which ones we led in, led in pickies if that's of any help, and maybe give a bit of a description of how we did it. But you know, please send us an email. Thanks. We've got um, another couple of questions about how to engage patients who don't think that they're very creative or don't think that they've got the um, sort of artistic flair that's needed. Um, and someone else who, who mentioned um, suggestions for male CAMs um, and male MSUs without a dedicated art space. So, so I guess the first part of that question is how do you encourage and inspire patients who don't think that they're artistic? I think we think about this so much because participation is such a huge aim for us mm. and so important um, for the delivery of our projects because we need people to contribute to the artist's ideas and we need people to offer their own expertise and their own experiences. Um, and obviously in PQ that can take and so you know the full spectrum of people who can sit with us for a while and others who you know, are much more uh, chaotic. Um, we we do a number of different things and we think about our workshops almost in a kind of hospitality way. Um, so part of what Tim was saying about setting up a room so that it's really intriguing and beautiful and interesting, even though that's a little bit time consuming, it does provoke some kind of interest and some kind of look in and some kind of way um, you kind of think something different is happening. Um, obviously, we also spend a lot of time, which I'm sure everyone does as well, um, prior to a workshop happening, having posters up on the wall, have it encouraging um, OTs or activities coordinators or any other staff member to be talking about these things that are available and that the things that are coming up and the things that are bubbling away and these exciting things so that you're kind of building up an anticipation or an interest. We're also totally open to how people kind of enter into a conversation with us, um, whether that is the first time it's a two minute, no way, I would never do this, and being able to just show a picture, just kind of incite some kind of small interest, just do something. And then the next time we come back a little bit more and a little bit more. Um, so I guess we think so much about, you know, those kind of warmth elements and welcome elements. And I know that that seems such a kind of silly thing to say, because I'm sure everybody does do that already, but that's, that's the way that we attract people is by very slowly, very repetitively inviting them in a really, really nice way. And we think of all the different things, whether that's we find out somebody enjoys this particular kind of biscuit, so we bring it the next time, 
or we know somebody is interested in planes so we bring something to do with that you know it's, it's often so much about individuals and repetitive behaviors and and the kind of the invite the the intrigue and the welcome and I, I'm sure that that, se that seems like a very simple answer, I think. And, the, and, and I think maybe there's also the fact that we have the novelty factor. So we're an external person coming in to lead these sessions. And sometimes that also is a kind of help. Um, mm. But basically, yes, it's, it's uh, what we, like Tim said, with even when people want to do one art work with us, it doesn't really work because we need time and we need we need repetitive contact with people to be able to build up that trust and get them in the door um and also that openness that you know you could just sit with us and have a cup of tea and chat and watch you know you don't have to achieve anything and then that moment when somebody does complete something it, that can be the big, biggest motivation at all because you know they've actually accomplished completing something i guess i guess the other thing is when when we bring artists in there is a bit of a stereotype busting moment where you know lots of people rightly or wrongly think artists are pretentious um, <laughs> lofty self-obsessed you know like that kind of <laughs> stereotype so we, so it's kind of you know knocking that stereotype mm -hmm. down actually artists are generally pretty normal as well you know if you meet them in real life and you know I think some there's there's one guy in the unit saying he thought all artists were uh, private school educated you know elitist. whatever elitist <laughs> but but now he's got a bromance with one of the artists and, and I think it that like completely understandably sometimes you know oh it's knocked out for you at school or parents told you and it's, it's not something you should be doing or um, you know, sometimes in male PQs we hear, you know, men not necessarily thinking that, that it's for them. And it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't take too much to, to let someone realise that actually it's okay to take part. Yeah. Um, I want to um, that down, it could be, um, be fun. Thanks. So we've got another question here that, that asks about um, the, the art workshop. So what do the video meetings involve and are you delivering an arts workshop? Yes, exactly. So crucially, this hasn't been launched yet, but we would like to launch it in June. Um, we've, we've got some Arts Council emergency funding to deliver this. And the idea is that at the moment we have no way of reaching patients, but with this little bit of funding, and with the you know collaboration with some um, willing units we would like for at least eight to ten different professional artists to lead live art workshops for patients in units uh, digitally so depending on a unit's capability to connect with a kind of a good internet connection and have a device to be able to do that people would be able to join in live and if they didn't have that they could download uh, videos um, at an internet source and then bring that into the unit so either the live sessions would be something that's a little bit longer people like today could type in questions and interact with the artist as they're kind of leading the session or you would have the more static version of the video that you could play at the beginning of a session and then do the workshop as that's happening um, and obviously depending on the uptake and how many people we can get involved and have the techni technology to do so we would be building on that so there would be a, a kind of stockpile of resources that people can work through and again you'd be looking at what your particular service users would be interested in could talk to us about um, requests for different types of workshops um and we can work together on format and things like that to make it as accessible as possible um, thank you um we've got a question from brad who says thanks for the presentation guys and um, the work you're doing is, is both valuable and admirable if possible would you be able to point us in the direction of your evidence base for your practice for some wider reading and keep up the great work and keep safe 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's been a number of really good literature reviews that have been published even in the last six months to, to year. Um, one of those is the Arts Council's um, created Creative Health um, that came out last year and that has a really good um, broad spectrum of different studies that look at both environment and also participatory practice. Um, the Bearing Foundation literally, I think, last month released um, another report called Created Out of Mind or something like that, Creative Mind or something. Um, again, looks specifically at participatory practice um, with regard to art and mental health. So not, not just in patient settings, but even more broadly than that, which is also very good. Um, we also look at the evidence around environment. So there are a few really good studies that talk about seclusion rooms, um, that talk about um, de-escalation and those kinds of things. Um, and while they may not come to any real conclusions about artwork itself, they have some really interesting insights about what we can provide for people. Um, to to make their environments more pleasant and I think one of the really interesting aspects of that is um, often it's not actually what something looks like at all or what colour it is or what pattern it's actually how involved people have felt in contributing to what it is um, and how relevant it is to them and their community so I think that's really interesting as well and then there's there is a um a peer-reviewed paper called Art and Mental Health in the Women's Psychiatric Intensive Care Unit in the Journal of Psychiatric Intensive Care that is about the hospital rooms project that we did at with Eileen Skellen one at SLAM. Um, so that that can be um, accessed to so that that's that's about the, the project in the women's PQ um, that we delivered in 2018. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we've got another one saying, can I ask if you can tailor your activities for individuals with learning and potential physical disabilities? I mean, I think all of the activities are like should be tailored and um, they are just guides, basically. And, you know, like Tim was saying, something like the cyanotype, it's so simple. It's literally laying out a piece of paper in, a, in an outdoor space, putting some objects on it and then washing it off. Um, so there are things that are really, really simple and then there are other things that are more complex but that could be adapted. Um, but again, it's, it's literally for your own individual circumstances. Um, uh, and I think also a lot of that comes with a little bit of familiarity with what the activities are and if people want support in kind of you know there's elements of the pdfs or things that you don't really understand or you think i don't know what this means you know you can get in touch with us we're we're you know we're on the end of the email there's not a big team or anything like that and if people do want support in terms of tweaking things or changing things or suggestions with materials or things like that you know you can always always get in touch um, and we'll have more as well. So at the moment, it's quite limited. We we kind of, um, you know, blasted out these these eleven in the first week. But the idea is that now we'll we'll expand on that. And we'll have more video workshops, and and hopefully we'll have a bigger mm -hmm. range as well. So so more that are even simpler and more that are even more complex. But we're really open to any ideas or any any recommendations of things you might like to see. Fantastic. We've got another uh, question about the video workshop. So someone has said that they sound incredible uh, and I think the service users that I work with would really engage in it. I was just wondering if like the projects, are there any are there any fees to partake in it? At the moment, no. Um, we would like to launch this basically as soon as possible for mm -hmm. as many people as possible. So our ask from you guys would be support in terms of like I was saying before internet access a little bit of annoying things like sorting out devices um, so that will take up a little bit of your time 
that's what we would ask for but there's no fee associated with any of the art school at the moment apart from the only thing that you might have to do is source some materials for certain workshops so before the workshops take place we'd give plenty of time to source whatever materials you might need we'll try and make most of them really simple so that they're able to be done with you know things that might already be in the unit but there might be certain things you know for instance if it was a cyanotype workshop we send a link to where you can get hold of them but we'll make sure that they're all very affordable and they're all things that are materials that are very easy to get easy to get hold of great um betty's got a suggestion for one of the workshops and that's uh, would you be able to do a mural tutorial it's quite um, hard to say mural a, tutorial that's a really yeah. uh, that's a really nice idea we've got one video that we've, we haven't put out yet that is is about making a kind of collaborative art yeah. art wall painting but i think a mural tutorial would actually be a fantastic <coughs> idea maybe maybe later today we'll think about which artist we could we could kind of try and push in that direction there's one artist called susie hamilton who did a an amazing painting at the junipers in devon and i think she'd be quite up for that she likes a big painting that's a brilliant idea yeah um, um, got another question here. So, how can we adapt art activities and groups during coronavirus? I'm finding it hard to clean every paintbrush, paint bottle, pencil after one patient has used it, and prox proximity is also difficult as it can feel awkward and distant. I mean, I can only empathise with you. I think it must be so, so difficult at this time, and good on you for keeping going with it and persevering. Um, I suppose we shouldn't comment too much about what the stipulations are around health and safety um, because trust to trust that will vary and and we actually haven't been allowed into units so it's very difficult for us to say how we've adapted things. Um, I suppose from what you're saying it sounds like having lots of different materials is, is a difficult thing and so um, perhaps we can think about different activities that really don't require touching lots of things or you know using multiple paint brushes or multiple art materials at one time um i, I mean we try and one of the things we um we try and do is limit the amount of colors that we use and try and talk about color mixing because one of the one of the things you often see, you know, whether it's in a, a mental health unit or an art school or anywhere, is that there's often 30 different kinds of paint there. And actually, you can make if you choose the right colours of paint, you can make any colour out of six uh, with a white. So it might be sort of limiting the amount of colours, and maybe that's that's a really good idea for something that we should be covering, um, which actually we hadn't thought about. Um, so maybe when we do when we do these workshops, we'll try and ask the artists to think about how they can do things with a single brush or several paints. And I don't know if it's possible for you to almost have like a, you know, like a kind of pencil case for each, each patient who takes part where they've got one brush and, and, and a few colours each. But, but if, if that does sound like it's something that's possible, maybe we could, we could get the artist to kind of almost start the workshop by talking about that. Um, it's not something we've thought enough about, so actually it's, it, it's brought something up that's really important. Mm. And I think that's all of the questions. We've got quite a few comments throughout just really um, agreeing with your points about it being all about participation and, and not, you know, less to do with just getting something up on the wall and, and how much that really is valued by, by everyone. Um, Oh, we've just had one more question come through, I think. So occupational therapists are sharing experiences and developing guidance on types of activities and how to deliver uh, and manage activity based therapy during COVID. Um, so if you're a NAPQ member, you can join the OT network for this learning and development. So thanks, Wendy, for sharing that. Um, but yeah, I think that's all the questions we've got. So I just want to say a huge thank you for coming on to this webinar and I hope everyone's found it helpful. Um, we'll be sending an email around when it's up on the website um, and I'm sure if you've got any more questions then Tim and Neve will be happy to, to answer them after afterwards, if that's all right with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. great. Well, thank you for joining us and I'm sure we'll, uh, you know, we'd be happy to advertise the online workshops and things like that. So just send the details through and we'll send them out. Amazing, Brilliant. thank you. Lovely. Yeah. Oh, thanks for having us. Great. Bye.